artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Welcome to episode 59. Kakia Chachu can tell you what a politician is really saying. Of course, many of us would be happy to say that the politician isn't saying anything at all, but she is much more precise about it, and she uses AI to do it. She's a professor at the University of Suffolk in the United Kingdom, and this work shows up in her research paper, Deep Learning for Political Science. And if you like that, she's got more in another paper titled Text Classification of Manifestos and COVID-19 Press Briefings Using BERT and Convolutional Neural Networks. Links in the show transcript. Her bio says, My research is driven by my fascination with all kinds of data, big, small, text, number, images, and how it can help us better understand ourselves and our society. I am also interested in how data can be used to improve resilience, maximize accountability and trust, and reduce inequalities. Well, analyzing the text of political briefings about COVID is a pretty incendiary environment to place yourself in, so it was with great interest that I talked with Kakia. Here we go with the interview. Kakia, welcome to the show. Hi, Peter. It's fantastic to be here with you today. A great opportunity to talk about AI and all the interesting stuff around it. Tell us a little bit about your background. You describe yourself as also a linguist. How does that come into play and how did you get into that? So I come from a very interesting and very mixed background in the sense that when I did my training back in 2010 at the University of Essex, I did a joint research between linguistics and computer science. At the time, it was called computational linguistics. Now we know its evolution or its next steps more as natural language processing. I'm sure you and the listeners know it's a branch, a flavor or a version of artificial intelligence. So it's a subfield of that. So I have been working with ways to make human language formalized. That means you basically are trying to establish how what language works and then be able to teach the computer or train a machine in sort of replicating it in the same way. So I've been looking at this from a theoretical point of view, but also more recently from a fairly practical point of view. And one very interesting area has been discourse in the media, discourse in political sphere, so political discourse, as we call it. So that's at the moment is what fascinates me. And I mean, very interesting in exploring research wise quite a lot. When you talk about formalizing natural language there, I want to explore what you mean by that, because my mind goes back to the good old fashioned AI days and summer of 1956. And they believed that they would be able to decompose human language the same way that we do Fortran or computer languages, parse it out into an abstract syntax tree and figure out meaning from there. How well did that go? Well, not very well in the sense that it sort of at a plateau at some point in the 90s and 80s. So there was loads of theory around how can we make that possible and loads of mathematical models. And to answer your questions by formalizing, I mean, exactly that, finding a way to describe it, model it, as we call it in research, in a way that you can very easily feed it to a machine that only understands instructions and very clear cut ones. So a process, a procedural way. So I get a feeling that there was loads of ideas, both coming from computer science, as well as linguistics, language, philosophy, that tried to make that possible, both in terms of how do we analyze a language and also how do we create new language? So the uh, fields of parsing, this is what it was called. So how do you divide it up? Also language generation, how do you generate? How do you create language? How does a machine pretend to be a human, the famous Turing test? And can we basically fake it so that humans think they're talking to a human? But then I think there were loads of issues when it comes to the computing power. So we reached a plateau, we couldn't do more. And then, of course, in the 
2000s, 2000s and onwards, you had this surge of lots of new technologies and speeds and new memory capacity all sort of being growing exponentially. So I think that created a new momentum and things started moving again. And here we are nowadays, quite a lot of interesting things happening. So let me try and understand here the difference that computing power made, because it had been my impression from outside that field that they got as far as trying to parse time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana and gave up the uh, figured that that approach wasn't going to work and that we're now we're using neural networks and machine learning to do natural language parsing from a different vantage point. I suspect I'm off there. Can you fill in the gaps for me? Possibly. If I may take machine translation as an example, which is, I think, exemplifies this really well. So there were loads of attempts to sort of describe languages, different languages, be able to map one onto the other, there was loads of work in terms of trying to model language so that either you translate from one to the other directly because you map the structures or you translate by an intermediate language. And there was loads of work in creating, for example, or getting the computers to learn by observing the translation of loads of parallel corpora, as they call them. That is translations of text into different languages. Now, that could be used as much up until, I think, the 80s, 90s, because of the barriers in terms of how quickly could a machine learn. And then as soon as you have all this computing power in some respects, then you have all these new frontiers where you have Google automatically translating because it has crawled the whole web in many different languages and it can now understand and can map one to the other. So that, I think, is a good example to sort of give you a feeling about how everything in terms of theory was there, but then having the technology made a difference. Well, I'm wondering at what point the idea of constructing a syntax tree where we decomposed English language like diagramming a sentence either was left behind or wasn't. You referenced machine translation there, and there was a hard event where Google switched from one way of doing things to a machine learning approach with neural networks to translation. And overnight, there was a radical improvement in the technology. And that must have had a huge impact on this business of natural language processing. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. I think you are spot on there in the sense that up until that point, I think both linguistics and computer science fields were trying to address the problem to be able to come up with a solution by relying quite a lot on human crafted rules and quite a lot of work that was being done in maybe learning from these parallel corpora. But you're absolutely right. The kind of interesting switch there was that you basically fed loads of data into the algorithm and the algorithm somehow magically, although we do know how this happened because we are the ones programming it, somehow actually learned these correspondences and was able to translate from one language to another. But again, I would like to sort of not say that this is not the end for the human contribution in that problem, because I think we are now coming to a circle where we are seeing quite a lot of work either using input from humans. And by that, I mean some examples where we have tasks where we're trying to, for example, classify this text. What does it belong to? That, But they're so specialized and they're so domain specific that you basically need some input and having some input from a human who's an expert in that task helps improve things. And I want to talk about some of the work you've done in that area with political text and COVID paper analysis. And first, though, there's a question that I have about explainability, because you talk about some level of magic, which often is invoked in one form or another when we're talking about machine learning because we've trained the system to tune its weights accordingly, but then all we're left with is a million magic numbers and we can say they work. Whereas if we were doing sentence parsing the good old-fashioned way, we would say, I know it means this because here is where it parsed out subject, predicate, object, verb, and everything else. Unfortunately, language isn't that neat, so we're not doing it that way. But then when you get into a domain where you have to justify your analysis, what does the explanation look like at that point when you have to ask this network? 
I think this is a very, very interesting area. I mean, there is that very big problem of, yes, we've left the neural networks to do what it's supposed to be doing. It's actually performing really well. We have very good results. It's marking, it's tagging the things, it's classifying the things it's supposed to be classifying in the correct way. Then how does it do it? So for some of the experimental stuff that I have been working on, it doesn't matter in the sense that we're doing research, we're just trying and playing. It's a sample. We're trying to classify images, for example, and see are they cats or dogs. That's not an issue if we classify some of them in the wrong way or if we don't really understand how the algorithm classifies that. Whereas when we actually get that problem transferred to a different domain, so classify these applicants, CVs, into people who match this job description better or worse, then at that point is, I think, where we absolutely need to understand how that process happens and what it is that it actually takes place. And how on earth does this algorithm decide that this CV is is a better match than others and to what percentage? So how close is it to that match? So I'm probably going a little bit around that question that you just asked me. But I think, yes, we have gained accuracy when we are doing neural networks. But we're now at the point where we're trying to find in more detail how exactly that decision is being made. And at the moment, because of how many calculations happen in a neural network, we are not fully there, but we are getting there, I think. Right. And you've illustrated exactly the sort of domain where that matters if you've got a neural network that you're training to tell the difference between cats and dogs, then it can become arbitrarily good at that as measured against test training data. And no cat is going to sue because it was misclassified as a chihuahua. If your input data is people who are more or less likely to reoffend in some criminal enterprise then you're in an entirely different area, not just the risk of being sued. There's civil rights involved. And so you're compelled to be able to come up with an explanation of how it made that choice. And yet the neural networks almost by definition hide that. Does your work get into that when you're analyzing the things that you've what we're going to be talking about? So for the recent work that I have been doing, I've been collecting, I'm at that crazy stage of collecting quite a lot of data, actually, in terms of text. So what I'm doing is I'm putting together a collection of texts. It's mainly the text of press briefings, either by heads of state or heads of health. So the Minister of Health around COVID situation. So we get them quite a lot in the UK. I'm sure you get them a lot in the US and I'm sure around the world Governments would announce initially during the first lockdown every day, but then nowadays maybe once or twice a week. Uh, So I've been collecting these, turning them into text that can be analysed using different natural language processing tools. And what I'm finding in that is I've tried to just classify it without any input from experts. So I've basically said to the neural network, just tell me what topics do you identify here? And I have found this to be not as helpful comparing that in terms of the meta-analysis, not in terms of understanding the texts as a human. So the neural network is doing its job. It's classifying, it's telling me, it's grouping words and it's telling me possibilities. So I've found then that I needed to take these and work with a political scientist, so an expert in analyzing political discourse, to be able to come up with something that's a little bit more sensible and meaningful. So all we do is we select which of these patterns make sense according to uh, what we understand in terms both of COVID and public health, as well as in terms of political discourse in general. So politicians talking politics. (laughs) Right. And this irresistibly reminds me of something I read long ago in Isaac Asimov's Foundation trilogy in the first book, there is an outpost in the galaxy that is visited by a central government bureaucrat and diplomat who spends several days with them talking, having discussions, negotiations, and they have a linguistic scientist there and he subjects what this diplomat said to a formal analysis and comes with, with the conclusion that in two days and talking all that time that this person had said absolutely nothing. Um, 
That's my, <laughs> that was my first no, exposure to that sort I, of analysis. What does your work turn up? How is it used? It's still in progress. So I can't tell you a very big sort of outcome out of it. I can tell you that there are times where this has happened as well, where there's loads of questions to the officials and they basically don't respond to the question that there is a couple of key messages that they just repeat and repeat and repeat. But in terms of the actual proper analysis, we're still, I think, a little bit far to go, only because we are not done yet. We are still collecting data. Where um, do you want to take that? What do you want to or hope to find out? I'm hoping to find out one of the aspects is exactly that. So do politicians or the, the officials that talk about a situation like we are right now, do they really communicate at risk, the risk of the pandemic, the risk of public health? Do they communicate it in an appropriate way? And we're also looking at indicators such as what sort of political system was that? So was it like a democracy? Was it not a democracy? Was it, for example, also the approach of the leaders? So there are certain states where the way they communicate political ideas is a little bit less objective than others. So we're looking at that as well. And also there have been, for example, some differences in the way certain states in Europe, the UK, as well as other states in Asia, have chosen to communicate the risk of a pandemic to the communities. So we're trying to see the effect of that difference to the reality. So did people trust their governments? Did they not trust their governments? Did they vaccinate? Did they not vaccinate? So there's another colleague who's working on the discourse around vaccination, anti-vaccination as well, that we're hoping we can complement that work. And when you're looking at how effective it was or what result it produced. I started thinking about, well, the difference between, say, how the Chinese government would communicate to its citizens versus Texas. And in Texas, a lot of the outcomes would be asserted by its population as having little to do with the government. And I think it would be easy to find a line of causality in China from what the government said to what happened. But In Texas, it seems like there are exogenous factors that have little to do with government that are shaping that discourse more. What sort of analysis are you doing in that respect to tease out a line of causality that it seemed you were talking about? That's very hard. Establishing a causality between something that somebody says and what happens is super, super difficult. And I don't think we are sort of aiming to do that. It's merely to describe maybe or try to identify some patterns around the events and how the pandemic evolved in each of the countries, but also trying to see how possibly that gets reflected into the discourse of the state. And by that, I would take either we're looking, for example, here in the UK, different municipalities, different counties have a very different approach to how they communicate risk within the county. So even if you ignored the state and the communications of the state and what you listen in the news, you would get different levels of information depending on whether you lived in Suffolk, for example, or in Essex, which is fairly local to us, and then other places in the UK. So for me, this is very interesting. Of course, it's not that my field I'm leaving that to the political scientists to explore. I'm just merely giving them the ideas and the patterns that come out from the text with the help of neural networks, with the help of AI, because obviously I couldn't have read all of these by myself and analysed them. So in some respects, it's sort of complementing the expertise that they already have in political science, but feeding into that in that respect. Is it fair to say that an outcome of this work might be to gauge how effective any given government's pronouncements were in achieving their desired goals? Possibly. But again, as I said, it's about what they say. So you can't necessarily say what you said caused this or caused so many deaths. There's no way you can link it up. But you can definitely say something about the events happening in a certain chronological order. So definitely would give us a way to look at that aspect as well, because loads of people are working and are researching, of course, health and the health of people and also their livelihoods, so the effects in the economy. 
but there's very little at the moment trying to explore that simply because we're living it, we're in it. So we're hoping that this will be building on and we'll be doing more work in the future on that. Do you take into account or are you able to factor in the different ways in which different demographics react differently to communications? Again, with the China versus Texas example, the culture is there so wildly different that what you can say to one group is not what you can do to the other. And so the communication can't be analyzed, it seems to me, without knowing the patterns, the mental behavioral patterns and reactions of who you're talking to. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. We are sort of assuming that everybody at the moment, because we're trying to narrow down the problem, we're assuming that everybody receives information in the same way, but you're absolutely right. One very important aspect of how you communicate risk is not just what you say and the context in which you say, but also who's the receiver. So the cultural background, as well as the perceptions and assumptions and worries and fears that that person might have. We're not going into that detail in the research, but you're absolutely right. It's very crucial in trying to understand why certain things happen in a certain way and why certain people, certain communities react in a specific way and others didn't. And if we follow that path, we end up at the black sheep of NLP or of Cambridge Analytica. Do you have any opinions on or evaluations of what they were doing? There seems to be some intersection. I'm not implying any great intersection, but I'm wondering if you have any particular insights in how they were able to do what they did. It was a very interesting example of what can happen if there isn't enough regulation framework to look after citizens, but also an example of what bad things can happen if you could take advantage of AI. And to me, AI is just a tool. So you can use it for good, you can use it for bad. I've had some very interesting interactions about using AI for a disaster prevention in that context of the work that I'm doing. And I've met with loads of very interesting people doing interesting projects in Colombia and Greece and UK. And all of them, they were using data and AI for good. But there are absolutely there are ways of using it for evil, if you like, for bad means, not for good. And of course, somebody will say, you know, what do you mean by evil? What do you mean? by good. And these are very moral ways of looking at the world. And I I can take that criticism. But at the same time, I think that it sort of highlighted, if anything else, that gap that existed. And in some respects, it was what created quite a lot of reaction in the sense that there was loads of electoral laws changed and rules changed since then. And people now are a bit more aware about how certain opinions can be manipulated and how your data can be used in a different way than you maybe you were hoping for. Yeah, so that's sort of a comment on that. But I am a firm believer. I was asked a similar question in that group. And I, I'm a firm believer in that people like us who know the, the technology a little bit and can communicate that to those maybe who don't know the details, who can demystify and make AI, a little bit easy to understand, have a very important role to play in helping people understand why it's not necessarily all evil or all good. So it's something that you need to be aware of. That's all. Over your career, how have you seen the role and importance of ethics in this work evolve over that time? This is a very interesting question. I think looking back, ethics used to be a kind of abstract notion that especially towards the beginning of my career when I was trained to become a researcher, right, and had very little contact with industry. It was a notion of something that you had to do, something that you had to tick a box to make sure that what you were doing was ethically, quote unquote, correct and according to the university regulations. But then coming out in the industry and working with data and people's data as well, in some respects, made me more aware and passionate about why it is important and why it's not just a tick box exercise. It's something that's there to protect you as a researcher, as somebody who uses data, somebody who who does work in an industry using data, but also the citizens themselves. So if that's the data that you're using, you're giving to a company or to an organization or to, to work with. So for me, it's Together with regulation, it's one other pillar 
of how we can make AI work for good rather than for bad reasons, for evil reasons. So it's something, of course, because ethics is very much linked to morals and what is considered morally correct and morally incorrect. But at the same time, as a society, as humanity, we have a certain set of values that we all consider, I think, to be common. And we can rely on these to determine what is ethically and what is not ethically correct. Also, there's loads of regulation. If you forget about ethics and AI in general, and you look at data in particular, it's something that's been brought into legislation in quite a lot of the countries. So I think I know that US has got a data protection legislation in the UK. We do as well. In EU, they also have a very big directive and different country states do the same as well. So, yeah, so that's kind of, I think, where I would be talking about with regards to ethics and how I consider the role to be in terms of AI. When I put together the different things we've been talking about with political discourse analysis and ethics and sort of jumble them all around and toss them together, I imagine that your work might lead to the possibility of analyzing someone's statements or actions to determine how ethical they were. Obviously, that's loaded in many ways, but let's just imagine that it isn't for a moment and (laughs) tell me whether you could see that as a product. Oh, this is a very interesting angle. I haven't thought that far into the future in terms of the outcome. Potentially, it could be used as a way to evaluate maybe and see whether certain governments or certain local authorities could have done more to help or could have communicated better. Certainly, I think this is an interesting area, but because in the field I'm working from, we tend to be mostly interested in the process of how that happens. So how do we come to a point where we can feed all that information into a neural network and then check out something that's meaningful? I think it would probably take a policymaker or a social scientist, somebody who's interested in sort of bringing somebody, a policymaking decision to judgment, to judge whether a political decision was correct or not. I don't think that would be for my place to do that. So I think that would be something that even though somebody could look at my work and use information from that to do that, I don't think that would be a direct outcome of what I'm aiming to do here. It is fascinating that we can now contemplate that without being laughed out of the room. When I was studying computer science, I was doing things like counting the number of times the word aardvark showed up in a corpus of text And the number of layers of abstraction we've now piled on top of that is impressive. So look then into the future with your work. What are your hopes and goals with respect to what that might produce and how it might be used? So in terms of the specific work that we have been referring to, I'm hoping that if nothing else I can give, I can hand down to other researchers a collection of all these speeches and corpora that then can be used for further analysis. And in some respects, this is kind of a byproduct of the research, but in some respects, for me, it's very important, both for for posterity in terms of the times we live in, but also in terms of saving somebody else the effort to have to compile that from scratch. And I'm not on my own in this. I'm collaborating with colleagues. I can only speak three languages. So that could be the end. Like I can only do certain groups of countries with that in my repertoire. So I am working with colleagues from other universities as well as who who know complementary languages, try and put that together. So that would be one. I hope for the future that somebody can then use that and then do further work whatever analysis, be it that they train an algorithm on it to do further classification or that they are a political scientist or a social scientist and they would like to study what society looked like in the pandemic. I also have a component where I am experimenting. So I'm basically benchmarking certain combinations of algorithms, neural networks. So I combine different technologies, different ways of abstracting from text and then going back and uh, generating again. I don't know if you're familiar with word embeddings and uh, words to vec, maybe our audience is as well. So there's different ways of abstracting from a word onto a vector and that gets fed directly to the neural network. So I'm experimenting with 
all these different ones. BERT is another one, Transformers. So I'm using different kinds of combinations and I'm hoping I can use these with different kinds of neural networks. So I'm combining all these and seeing which works better and mm. benchmarking again. So that's another area of what excites me at the moment. And I'm hoping that I can use that to create some interesting results. But then looking at not just this specific corpus, but generally AI and how we can use it to help with prevention, especially in a crisis. I think there's loads of areas I'm hoping I will be doing in the future, especially around disaster emergency prevention and the use of AI. So I have some ideas about satellite imagery and how we can use that mm. to compare the before and after. But this is for the future. And you'll probably hear from me. So I haven't got a paper to show you yet on that one. Oh, I'd love to hear about it when it does happen. You were talking about word to vec That's mapping words into Vectors. different semantical spaces, right? And dimensions of relationship. That reminds me of something my children often try to do to me here. Let's see what happens here. Follow along. Say the word silk. Silk. Say the word silk. Silk. Say the word silk. Silk. What does a cow drink? Once again. What does a cow drink? Oh, milk. I don't know. <laughs> no, it doesn't drink your milk. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> oh, you heard right. me. No, it doesn't drink milk. It produces milk. It drinks water. Right. <laughs> right. But we would, so you see how that works. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? It's yes. doing the same thing. You're converging in this yeah. semantical space of things that we drink. And now we go to cow and we're talking about drinking and cows. Oh, milk, except, of course, it's not. Oh, you got me. The cow, the cow drinks water. <laughs> I think that's a... No, I think it's exactly that. So the kind of notion behind this is exactly that. You basically, you represent relationships between words in a document or in a paragraph, if you like, to make it smaller. You represent these relationships as vectors. So as not rather than linear or uh, predicate relationships. So you basically, it shows up as a table of loads of relationships and loads of numbers that show you how relevant they are and how likely they are. And this is a fantastic way of, albeit, again, the linguist in me always shouts out, no, 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 no. But it's a fantastic way of representing uh, relationships between words and which, for example, which word will follow is more likely to follow. So it's absolutely links to what I just did with the milk and the cow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, somewhere in that space of things that are drunk, uh, cows and milk are closer than cows and water. Yeah, and the first thing, I mean, it, it's fascinating how you don't, I don't know how that happened, but I bet there is a reason why the brain works that way. <laughs> Neuroscientists would have a different yep. take on it, I'm sure. <laughs> Just as a last question here, imagine that you are talking to undergraduates and you know somewhere in this crowd are going to be people that you would love to have on your post-grad research team down the road. So you want to make them aware of the good, bad and the ugly of this field so that anyone who's going to enter that has the motivation to do that. What do you tell them? I would say it's one of the most exciting and fascinating fields. For me, it's a labor of love for a long, long time. So I can't offer you an objective, of course, a view on that, but I can tell you what excites me about it. It's the fact that no matter especially nowadays, no matter what I do, so be it typing something on my phone or saying something to my Alexa or my Google Assistant, it's the technology behind it and it sort of drives that work behind it. But also I think it still is a young field in some respects that we are, are expecting to see quite a lot of interesting things happening in the field, both in terms of how we are now using all these computer science and language linguistics tools and frameworks to bring that into the description of our everyday language and our everyday society. But also because ultimately language is communication, it's who we are and how we live and its behavior. So I think it offers a fantastic lens into looking into ourselves and our behavior. I can't promise you if you're a student, that this will be an easy ride. This is a very frustrating place to be, especially when you're trying new things and especially when you get your hands on some code and you're trying to make something work. But the results will absolutely excite you and will make you feel as if you're part of something bigger. 
So hopefully that was a good pitch. <laughs> oh, that was perfect. I hope you can take that out of the recording and use it for putting up on your website as a pitch in and of itself, because I think it was perfect. That'd be nice. Absolutely. I'm actually attending an open day event. This is the kind of event we hold at the universities where applicants for undergraduate and postgraduate degrees come and speak to us. So hopefully we can get a few of them interested this year, especially in that area of artificial intelligence and language. I think it would be fascinating. Kakia Chachu, is there anything you'd like to tell our listeners about where to find your work or follow you? The easiest way to follow me is find me on LinkedIn by searching my name or on Twitter, I'm a Kakia C. And it'd be fantastic to hear from you and hear from you if you listen to that podcast. Terrific. Thank you very much for coming on AI and You. It was lovely to be here. Thanks for inviting me. That's the end of the interview. I think it's amazing what people are now doing with AI to extract meaning from language. And it's mind-boggling to think what could be done with even a modest advance in applying it in all sorts of domains. Would it mean that we could finally say that AI understood us? Oh, and you can try that trick about milk out on your friends and see if you can catch them. My kids would love it if you did. In a rather relevant news item ripped from the headlines about AI, Google released a new product called Lambda at the Google I.O. 2021 event. Not to be confused with Amazon's Lambda service, this is the language model for dialogue applications, and it is much better at following conversations in a natural way rather than as a series of badly formed search queries. CEO Sundar Pichai said, quote, it's open domain, which means it is designed to converse on any topic. For example, Lambda understands quite a bit about the planet Pluto. So if a student wanted to discover more about space, they could ask about Pluto and the model would give sensible responses, making learning even more fun and engaging. If that student then wanted to switch over to a different topic, say how to make a good paper airplane, Lambda could continue the conversation without any retraining. Pichai there getting into heavy controversy by calling Pluto a planet. And Lambda is being used to improve the experience of people using the core Google service of search. It's still only trained on text. But when people communicate with each other, they do it across images, text, audio, and video. So, Pichai said, quote, we need to build multimodal models try saying that three times quickly, to allow people to naturally ask questions across different types of information, end quote. So you could one day plan a road trip by asking Google to find a route with beautiful mountain views. Next week, our guest is Tomasz Mikolov, a computer science PhD, and will be talking about his research for good AI, the Czech institute that aims to build AI that can automate cognition in scientific research and at Facebook AI Research. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.